chapter to be chapter 1, but there's no chapters in 2 John. But if you'll find 2 John, uh, we're going to read verses 7 and 8. But before you stand up, just kind of want to catch us up. We, we've really been uh, going through the evening services with ways to deal with the darkness or ways to deal with what's going on, the evil of the world. And naturally, we all go back to the truth and application of the Word of God that gives us the help in that. But I'm going to tell you what, the more I read and the more I study, you see a whole lot of a small remnant of people that support and help each other during those times of persecution and during those times of darkness. That's why it's so important and such a blessing that Jesus Christ established the church, let alone uh, Christians, that we can help and support uh, and, and be of assistance to one another, right? There's, there's enough discouragement and criticism and hatred outside these walls. We don't need it in here. And truthfully, those of us that have been born again ought to have the joy of the Lord within us to make sure that we are helping and supporting one another anyway. But we talked a little bit, I think it was about three or four weeks ago, about how deception or deceivers will continue to deceive. And so I kind of want to just cover a little bit of that out of 2 John uh, here this evening. I don't know how far we'll get, but we'll see. If you found 2 John, please stand with me. We'll read verses 7 and 8 and get right into the message here this evening. 2 John verses 7 and 8. The Bible says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Father, thank you for the precious word of God. I pray that you'd help my voice tonight, help Caden's signs tonight, Lord, that you just draw us closer to you. Give us a little hope, Lord, in darkness. Just help us to see your face here tonight. I pray that you'd show your presence. Thank you for the singing, God. Thank you for the faithfulness of your people. We just ask just to give us a little taste of you this evening. We ask you for your help, your wisdom, and your guidance in all that we do. Holy Spirit, open our eyes to the truths. God, help us to be able to make application to what we see and hear tonight, Lord. Help us just to put away life, just to put away the, the thoughts of everything that will have to go on when we walk out of here, God, that we can just have a little bit of time of rest with you. We love you, Father, and we thank you for all you do for us. Thank you for salvation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Appreciate you standing and be seated. Now, John hints to this uh, deception uh, that's going on here in, in, verse, in verse 7. Let me get this thing running here. Me and technology are great. Verse 7. Uh, he, he talks about for many deceivers are entered into the world, okay? Before we dive into that, though, I want you to turn back to 2 Timothy with me real quick. 2 Timothy. Everybody, everybody turn there, and I want you just to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Th this was about the area uh, when we started this study. And I just want to remind us of this deception that's going to happen and go on during the last days. Timothy, uh, Paul is pinning to Timothy perilous times or uh, days of uh, dark days and hard days are going to come, all right? And he talks about the differences that will go on in those individuals. But specifically in verse 13, he says this, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So I'm going to read it again. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, I'm not a big government, political kind of individual, but it's interesting when you try to watch some of that stuff that, one person will say a lie, and then the other person will try to cover the lie, and the other person will forget the lie that they tried to cover up for the other lie. And it just reminds me of what the scripture says, that those that are deceivers will be deceived, okay? And I know I just mentioned that was with the politic government aspect of it, but I do want you to understand that that is the devil's goal. The devil's goal is deception to deceive believers. You say, why is that? The devil cannot steal your salvation, Hope you understand that. Uh, the devil cannot take your salvation. When you're saved, your name's written down in the Lamb's book of life. It is eternally there. And I thank God that it's eternally there. Why is that? Because my works have nothing to do with my salvation. You with me? And the Bible says, For them gave you power to become the sons of God to those that believe on his name. Now, the only way that you cannot become or no longer be a son is by death, Right? Or if you really think about it, the DNA from me and my child is forever there. No matter if Caden messes up, 
uh, and he's the sorriest kid in the world, he's still my child. There's nothing that can do to separate that. You with me? So the moment we believe in Christ Jesus, in, in an illustration, we have the DNA, the DNA. I am forever his child. These things have I written unto you, that you may know that you have eternal life. John 3, 16 is a great one, right? If you believe in Christ Jesus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, what? Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So the scripture is very, very clear that when an individual believes and trusts in Christ Jesus, it is an eternal salvation that can never go away. In Peter, he even mentions that I am kept by the power of God by my faith through Jesus Christ. It's very, very evident that my salvation is settled forever. So you might be thinking, why in the world would the devil want to deceive a child of God then? Why, why would he want deception in the world? Well, number one, to hinder the gospel, right? Uh, which is why there are 15,000 ways to get to heaven according to the world. You can read any kind of religious book. You can read any kind of uh, heretic, and they can give you any kind of description on how to get to heaven that would not be scriptural. So if the devil can deceive an individual in not believing in Jesus Christ, and then he's won that individual to a devil's hell, uh, if you want to say it that way. He's, he's, he's deceived or blinded them to the gospel, uh, Corinthians tells us. That's what the devil is doing, is blinding them. Okay, So that's one reason for the deception. But number two, the deception is there to the believer because who is supposed to be shining the light of the gospel into a dark world? Well, it's you and I. It's those of us that have been saved and born again. We have a mission, if you will. We love God so much that we want to share the gospel with Christ, I mean, with the lost. We want them to know and understand salvation so that they don't have to go to a devil's hell. You with me? So if the devil can deceive us, trip us up, or make us doubt, then there's a victory that's gained by the devil in hindering the work of the Lord and hindering the gospel of Jesus Christ going out. So the devil wants to deceive individuals. Deception and deceiving also leads people to what? Discouragement and depression. And when an individual is discouraged and an individual is depressed, they're not doing anything for the Lord, right? I mean, truthfully... Most discouraged and, and depressed people don't even do anything for themselves, let alone for the Lord. That's where the devil wants you. That's not where God wants you. Listen, child of God, God wants you to be joyful and rejoicing. I understand life comes at us, we have problems, but the devil doesn't want you to rejoice. God wants you to rejoice in him and be happy and excited and full of this zeal and joy to go forth to work and do the thing that God would have you to do. Sharing the love that's within you. Now, this deception is going to arise, if you will, as Paul is writing to Timothy during these last days. Now, remember, this was 2,000 years ago. They expected Christ to come back just as we're ready for Christ to come back also. But sin is sin, and sin will always be sin. Now, I think there's, like I said before, there's more of an opportunity to get involved in sin because it's right there at your hand. Everybody carries around that computer that they have in their hand, right? And in the blink of a button or a click of a button and a blink of an eye, you can have anything you want under the sun, right? So it's absolutely accessible, but please remember, sin is sin. And, and technology is what technology is. I don't want to go down that road. But during these last days, this deception is going to continue so much that the deceivers will be deceived even of themselves, now, John writes this letter, and a lot of people say that this lady, the elect lady that he's speaking of, could be the church, the children could be church plants, but I'm not an allegorical individual. I believe he's writing this letter literally to a lady to help her and encourage her during some times of deception, during some hard times. So John's going to give us a little bit of instruction here that we can pull out. I think that'll be a, a help to us. Now, remember, deceivers are always against truth. Deceivers want you to believe that there is no absolute truth, okay? As a matter of fact, it's all relevant. It's just relevant to however you want, and it's constantly changing. Kind of sounds like the world we live in today, does it not? There is no absolute truth, according to the world. They can't define genders. They can't uh, define uh, mental illnesses. They can't define that. They, they can't define these things because there's no truth to them. Hence, it's constantly changing. Right? Uh, I'm not trying to pick on these things, but it's interesting to me that uh, you know somebody will put a, a woman into a place, and they'll say, oh, this is the first woman to be in there. 
But then you take the same group and say, can you tell me what a woman is? They can't define what a woman is. You know what I mean? Because there's no relevant truth. They just change it to match what they want it to match. So that's why I thank God that we have truth. We have black and white what God's given us to go back to. Listen, folks, if you're not rooted, you're going to be just as changing like the rest of them. Matter of fact, Ephesians tells us that's the purpose of preachers and teachers and evangelists in the church to make sure that you don't go to and fro with every wind of doctrine so that you're not ever changing. If you're not rooted yourself, I promise you, you're going to just be deceived just like the others are deceived, and you're going to become that individual that's ever changing as well. That's what the devil wants. That's what deceivers want. And we've been warned that evil men are going to wax worse and worse. Good is going to become right and right is going to become wrong. We live in those times today and I believe there's an application to be made that they lived in those times there as well. Now specifically, John nails down what this deceiver is disclosing, okay? This deceiver in verse 7, if you see, says or states, look what he says in verse 7, for many deceivers are entering the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. So the deceiver that John is trying to uh, warn or protect or give knowledge to this lady about is be careful who you receive information from. Be careful who you hang around with. Be careful who you're seeking out because not everybody believes that Jesus was God in the flesh. Okay? And during the time of John's writing 2,000 years ago, there were people going around. We know as we look at the Bible, the Jewish people did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Right? And what were the Jewish people doing? Churches were being established, people were being saved, people were being discipled, and the Jews were creeping into that. The Pharisees, let me rephrase that, the Pharisees were creeping into that to curb the mindset that Jesus Christ was and is the only way. Matter of fact, those that would, I think they changed their fight or battle, if you will, by saying that wasn't the Messiah, that many of them changed. You remember in Galatians, yep, you were saved by grace, but you've got to be circumcised to maintain that salvation. They had a whole council on that in Acts chapter 15 where they came together and said, no, no, it's only by grace and the Gentiles are brought in as well. So they would try to creep in and change sound doctrine because they are deceivers. They're deceivers. In Jude, verse 4, the Bible says this. I'll flip over there. In Jude, verse 4, the Bible says this. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He said lasciviousness is, is looseness. Can I say it this way? Taking advantage of the grace of God. It's, it's this mindset of this love movement. Is God love? He sure is. Does God hate some things? He sure does. Uh, if God loves us, is there not discipline that's involved in that? Absolutely. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that, right? But there's this movement of you do the best you can. It's humanism. You, you do whatever you think is okay, and God loves you, and God will forgive you, and God will still continue to meet your needs, and God will do this. You have the prosperity gospel. I'm still lacking. I'm not a millionaire yet. I mean, you, you have all of this mindset that's out there of the grace of God. Listen. God's grace was given through the death of Jesus Christ. And he has all rights to say, if you want to be saved, this is the way, as well as he has all the rights to say, this is how you're to live your life. So the grace of God ought not be in lasciviousness, as it says there. It's not looseness. There are some restrictions, if you will. There are some standards. Like, a lot of people don't like that word. They think it's a cuss word. Standards that God gives us to help us to live our life in according to his will and his way. So he said some of these men crept in. These are deceivers to change the grace of God, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They were in that day, they're in this day. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, that we henceforth, I mentioned it, be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men. And cunning craftiness, look what it says, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Changing scripture, changing doctrine, changing the way of salvation, changing the way we 
practice in church, what we do in church, right? Church polity, changing the way we live our life, changing the mindset, the characteristics of God, changing humanity. I mean, we see that even now within the world. These things are ever changing. Why? Because of deception. There are deceivers. We have to be able to ID these deceivers. The devil wants folks to depart from the faith. He wants them to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 tells us. So deception is a pretty big deal. It's an absolute big deal. The world, all the devils and demons, want you to fold up and fall to deception. They want you to become discouraged. They want you to become depressed. They want you to become a heretic for the whole purpose of stopping the work of the Lord. It may sound or seem good, but what's embedded in it is a lie. And you say, well, it's okay, preacher, I understand what you're saying. Sure, sure, I know what a dog is. I know what a cat is. I know what a woman is. I know what a male is. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm squared away there. Can I ask you something, though? Do you understand what the Word of God tells you and teaches you? Yeah, I got that nailed down. I'm good to go. Well, can I remind you of a lady named Eve who was in the Garden of Eden, uh, who was walking in the cool of the day with God, and her husband, Adam, with her, who would walk in the cool of the day with God. And none of us have walked with God because we can't hear his voice. We walk with God through his scripture that he gives us. But daily, they were in the Garden of Eden. They'd have to do anything because God provided everything for them. And this old subtle serpent shows up and gets her to question God. He's a deceiver. The devil's a liar. He's always been a liar. And he caused Eve and Adam, who would walk with God, to question what God said, to eat whatever that miserable fruit was, <laughs> to throw us all into condemnation. Deception. What is the little bit of a lie that's in that truth? There's a lot of religion in the world, right? I, I, people ask me often, what's the right church? What's the right Bible? What's the right religion? Uh, that's a conversation on the hearts and minds of individuals, and I think sincerely on some of them. And I say, well, what does that thing say? And if you go to the church, you say, I, I don't know what church to go to. Well, the first thing you ought to figure out is how do you get to heaven? You ask them how to get to heaven. Go to whoever that individual is and say, can you tell me how to get to heaven? Right? Many of them say, I can't tell you how to get to heaven. That's God's business. That's God's judgment. Well, that's not a church. <laughs> That's, that's not a biblical church because they can't give me the answer that God has recorded down that I can have. You with me? Deception is very, very tricky. It's very subtle, and we have to make sure that we recognize it. And the scary part or the worst part of the whole thing is that as the days get worse and we get closer to Christ's coming, the deception and the deceiving is increasing, if you will. It's, inbound, it's abounding, right? I mean, I'm just going to be odd. Secularly speaking, I'm only 47 years old. I know you thought I was 30. I'm only 47 years old, and in my lifetime, I'm amazed. At the, I'm not talking about spirituality. I'm just talking about the way of people in the world. I am amazed at the uh, growth and the, just the acceleration of the craziness, the nonsense that's going on in our country. It's, it's amazing to me. I, I'm not talking about politics. I'm just saying I know what a dog is, bless God. <laughs> I know what a boy is. I'm just saying. It's crazy, the acceleration of what's gone on, secularly speaking. Now, you want to know what else is amazing, though? Is where is the Christians during this time? Where is the house of God during this time? Where are the people of God during this time to combat that deception, to fight off that deception, right? And I wonder many times it's because we don't understand why we believe what we believe. We don't understand what the scripture says. And it's very, very, very important because somebody might come knocking on your door to try to tell you what you're doing and believing is wrong. And you better know the scripture to be able to ward off that deception that's coming at you. So here's a lady that John is penning this letter to. And John gives some help in verse 8. John tells us in verse 8, he says, look to yourselves. Look to yourselves. That's an interesting statement to be made. In other words, look to the people that you've been brought up with or look to those that you've understood truth with. Can I say the application for today would be, how about your church? How about other fellow believers that are doctrinally sound? What are they saying? Followers of Christ, if, if you could say it that way. You guys need to yoke up together. I know I say it over and over and over again. The church is a family. It's a family. 
Now, I know everybody in the family doesn't always get along, but suck it up and get over it, right? I know we don't always get along, but we are a family to forbear, to help, to rejoice, to cry, to support, to encourage. God gave us the church for that purpose and that reason. And John tells this lady in this letter, when the deceivers come, look to yourselves. Now specifically, if you want to be literal, he's talking about the woman and her children. Okay? The, the children that she's taught, you'll see some of the things that she taught them. Look to your family because you have the truth. Don't be deceived. Get together as a church body. Ask questions. Iron sharpeneth iron, right? Let's figure out what the Word of God says so that we can recognize the deceivers so that we don't get deceived. Remember who you are and what you are as a child of God. You're victorious. You're an overcomer, right? When you forget those things, you forget or you lack of the power and the reliance that God has given you. Deception steals our joy by fogging our truth. Deception steals our joy by fogging our truth. We begin to doubt what we know, and then we wonder, well, is the Bible real? Is Jesus really coming back? Does God really love me? A question that's been on my heart and mind quite frequently is, how much do I really love God? Right? We begin to doubt those things because of the deception that comes. And deception is going to begin to gain ground, and we're going to fall prey to it. So here's just a couple things real quick tonight that we can see out of 2 John that I believe will be to help. The first thing we see is in verse 2. In verse 2. Now he says, for the truth's sake, or for the cause or the reason of truth, for the truth's sake which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. So how do we combat or how do we deal with or how do we get through these deceptive days or how do we recognize who these deceivers are? The simple answer is by truth. It's by truth. It's by the word of God that God has given us. And, and it's because of a cause and a reason of truth's sake that we have to continue to fight and combat deception. Jude said the same thing over there, right? He says we contend for the faith. We continue to fight against deception and deceivers. You say, what does that mean? Well, when deception pops up or I'm trying to recognize this deceiver or recognize this deception, the very first thing I need to know is understand, well, I have truth. I have truth to be able to say, well, that's wrong and that's wrong and that's wrong and not with a snide attitude, but I see what the Word of God says. I says, okay, if this is what God says, then that's wrong. I'm not even going to entertain it. I'm not even going to look down the road. I'm not even going to investigate that. I'm just going to stay with the truth that I have. Number two, why is it important? We say, I don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You just go home and don't worry. No, it, we have to stand for what we believe. You have to. You have to continue to fight for what you believe. You have to. I'm not saying we take up arms and go out there. I'm not saying we be all vicious and mean. But we cannot back down with the message that we have of truth. You can't. Eternity is in the balance for those individuals that are unsaved because of the message that we have. And the more we hold up and the more we back down and the more we're not going forward, right? The churches that continue to go forward, the, continue, the churches continue to be on the offense, if you will. We've never been told to hold up and just wait for God to come back. You never see that. You say, well, I'm not sure about that preacher. Well, every apostle, every disciple... Every saved individual that we see that did anything went into every city, went into every town, and preached the gospel despite the fact that they would go to jail and despite the fact that they would get killed and despite the fact that they were threatened to not do that. What did they say? We must but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We'd rather obey God than man. So we're to continue this fight and moving it forward. Why is that? Because tr truth makes changes in lives. Has not the word of God made a change in your life? Don't you want to share that change that's happened in your life with other people? Hopefully you would. Hopefully you will. So he says there, for the truth's sake or for the cause of truth that dwells in us forever. We are to continue to fight against that, recognize that lies are lies, deception is deception, and to allow the truth through us to fight against that, if you will, that deception uh, and those lies. Verse 4, he says to them, I, rejo I rejoiced greatly. I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth. Walking in truth. So the first thing we see in verse 2 is that we do have everlasting truth. It's not going to change. Truth is truth. There's a reason. There's a cause. It's a good purpose for us to fight for. It's truth. Number two, 
What do we do with that truth? Verse 4 tells us we walk in that truth. We continue to be in obedience to the commandments that God has given us. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth. Now something interesting about that statement is remember he's writing to the lady and he's commending the lady for her children. Well, how do you think her children picked it up? She taught them. She believed the truth wholeheartedly. She taught her children to understand what the truth was wholeheartedly so that they wouldn't be deceived. They wouldn't have any deception in their life. So this walking in that truth is not just knowing what the Word of God says, but it's literally applying what the Word of God says. So this family is walking in truth. They're fighting for the cause and the right of truth. They're deciding, making the decisions to yield to that truth, to make application, to permit the Word of God to be their guiding light. If you deal with people long enough, you'll take them to Scripture and two things will happen. They'll change or they'll flee. They don't want the spotlight of the Word of God to expose their sin. They don't like the feeling, if you will, of conviction. They don't like how that feels to them. They don't like it. So they'll flee from it or they'll make that change. They'll turn towards Christ. They'll make the change that's needed to be made, to, to, to be made in their life to turn to Christ. So it's good to have the truth, but how much better that we yield to that truth and we walk in that truth. This is what's going to help us see the light in dark days. This is what's going to help us and show us what truth is when deception shows up. There may be a day that they try to take the Bible away. There may be a day that the Bible is illegal. It's illegal in many countries. They don't have that light to recognize deception. So if they take it away, then they can give you what you want and you'll believe what they say. Truth is a good reason to fight for. Truth is something that we absolutely need in our life. They were walking in it. So don't just take it and understand it, but walk in it. Walk in it. Verse 5 and 6. Verse 5 and 6. So we see the first thing, that there's a reason, there's a cause. It's truth which dwells in us forever. We see in verse 4 that we take that truth that's forever and we walk in that. And we obey the commands that God has given us to receive. Verse 5 and 6 talk about love. And I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. It's nothing new, John says, but that we're supposed to love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandment, verse 6. This is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. So truth, walking in truth, and love. This love was for the beginning, we know that. God loved us, or we love God because he first loved us, right? And we do know that we are to love one another, and we know that love is truth, and truth is opposite of deception, which is a lie. And love is a fuel to survive, really. Let me say it this way. If, uh, you know, everybody always jokes about the, the mama bear and the cubs. But let me ask you something. If somebody broke into your house or tried to come and harm your children, your love for your children would cause you what? To fight for them, Right? Your spouse, the same thing, a friend, a relationship that you may be in. Your love for that individual would cause you to, if you will, rear up to be in defense of whatever that child or spouse or friend is. You would rear up in that defense to fight against that because the love of God that's, I'm sorry, because the love for that individual that's fueling you to fight for them, right? How about our love for God and truth? Truth is what helps us to recognize what deception or a lie is. We have the truth, but yet we don't fight for the truth. In Ephesians, they say that we speak the truth in love. We, we give the, the, the truth, the word of God, in love. So we recognize when the deceivers come up and how detrimental it is is that we fight for the truth because of our love for the truth. In other words, if we love God, why don't we fight for God? If we love the Word of God, why don't we fight for the Word of God? If we love our children and our spouse, we certainly will fight for them. Love is our foundation. So I ask you, do you love Him enough to fight for Him? Do you love the Word of God to recognize what the truth says so that we can understand what the Word of God says to ID what that deception is? John added to that and said, Love is walking in His commandments. He says, this is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Why, verse 7, because the deceivers are in the world. Can I say it's almost like a, a bubble, right? We pick on people sometimes that get hurt or not so graceful or 
are sick often, right? We say, we got to put you in a bubble so that nothing happens. If you want a protective bubble, if you will, if you want a protective force field, right, if you have crazy imagination, what is that? It's truth. It's the truth that God's given to us so that we can be protected and we can recognize deception before it creeps in. People that are unsaved are already children of the devil, right? Now, I know the devil is working to keep them blinded. But if you really think about it, the devil works overtime to go after individuals that are doing something for the Lord, that are trying to push truth in a, in a dark world, that are trying to expose lies and deception, right? I mean, you see that in the, in the political and the government and the, in the judicial system all the time, all the fights that are going on, right? But can I just say, where, where are we at? Where are we at? Where, where is our fight to expose the deception, where is our fight for the, the neighbor that's following a, a false religion? Where, where is our fight for the Christian that's being pulled in the wayward way of believing a heretic and believing false doctrine? Where is our fight? So many times today Christians just say, well, judge not. It's not, not my job to judge. Well, if it's a stinking apple tree, it's an apple tree, right? You with me? If you're a drunk, you're a drunk. I'm not judging you. I'm telling you what you are according to what the scripture says, right? Galatians 6 1 says it's our job to restore such a one. When we're spiritual, right heart, loving manner, we've got to fight. Listen, folks, we've got to fight to protect our children, our cause, our right, for the reason of truth. Because they, the evilness of this world, wants to change that. And it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. So John tells this lady and her children. You have a good reason, you have a good cause, it's truth, it's eternal. And if you'll walk in that truth, if you'll obey the commandments that are written in that truth, you'll get the help that you need. And it ought to produce in you a love, and that love will help you to fight for that truth. And that love will help you to love one another. Why is that? Because in verse 8 he said, look to yourselves. Look to yourselves that you lose not those things which we have wrought. You lose not the gain that we have. I'm reminded, if you remember the four things, it always it grieves my heart, really, when the seed of the Word of God is preached, 75% chance that it's going to die. That's huge. Remember the first one, it falls on there and the devil steals it away. The second one, you have the, the, uh, the, the rock and it's not rooted. The third one, you have uh, that the thorn grows up and the thorns and the cares of the world choke it out. That's 75% of when the word of God is preached. And I can't help but think of the deception that we fall into by thinking, oh, the world's more important, we let it take us. Or the deception that it doesn't have to be rooted. Listen, you can be a, uh, a complacent, nonchalant Christian and you'll be all right in life. Yeah, that's not true. Or uh, when the devil shows up and says, don't believe that. You really believe what the preacher's saying? You really believe what that Bible's saying? You really believe what they're all, don't believe that junk. 75% chance. But then there's that last one. It says when it falls into the good ground, it roots, it grows up, and it produces fruit. It's only 25%. It's only 25%. We do have a fight ahead of us. We do have deceivers that want to cause death, spiritually speaking. And we ought to love God and love truth enough to fight for that. You're never going to recognize the deception if you don't understand the truth. It's the truth that exposes that. We need to help each other and work together. We need to understand that the world is full of carnality and sinfulness, and evil is not going to help you out in these dark days. The devil will try to make you think that if you are allured away from the things of God that you'll be all right. You just need a break from those things. But listen, adding more darkness to darkness doesn't produce light. We need light to guide us in those dark days. And how do we do that? We adhere to the word of God. We sharpen one another. We encourage one another. We try to help each other remember the truth that's been taught so that we can walk in that love correctly. He told her, and I'll read it again in verse 8, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. We receive a full reward. In the evil days, the deceivers will wax worse and worse. Deception will get worse and worse. The only way we can combat that 
and keep ourselves from discouragement is fighting for, recognizing, and applying truth to our life. How much of truth do you have? How much of the light do you have? Do you really trust it? Do you really believe it? Are you able to recognize the subtility of the devil? Are you able to recognize the false doctrine? Are you able to recognize the deceptions of the devil that want to pull you down to keep you from moving forward? Again, I'll leave you with the illustration. Adam and Eve walked with God. Adam and Eve walked with God. He deceived them. He deceived them. The only way we're going to overcome that is by the help of each other rooted in the Word of God. Father, thank you for the precious Word of God tonight, Lord, this letter that John would pin down. Lord, we see there's a great cause in there, there's no doubt. It's the truth of the Word of God. It's, it's fighting for you, Lord. We see that you've given to us a, a vessel, if you will, or a place to come together. That's the local New Testament church, Father. You've given us a purpose, if you will, commandments or instructions in the Word of God. Lord, we have every tool, every option that's available, we have it. We have it, Lord. So in reality, we have no excuse to fall the, to deception. We have no excuse to fall to the deceitfulness of the devil. We have no excuse for that, Lord. And especially if we are a church that loves one another because we ought to be there to say, whoa, whoa don't listen to that. Don't, don't look at that. Don't go there. Don't do that. Listen, brother. Listen, sister. Uh, that's the way of the devil. If you go that way, you could end up in the net, in the snare of the devil. You can end up in the wiles, being taken down by the wiles of the devil. You, you don't want to go down that road. Listen, folks, we need to help each other, God. I pray that you'd help us to recognize that. Lord, may we truthfully love one another enough to say, listen, I'm fighting for you, brother. I'm fighting for you, sister. And the decision you're making are not good. They're not wise. That's deception. And if you go too far down that road, you're going to fall. Father, I pray, help us, Lord, to understand what the truth says. Help us to understand how to apply that truth. Help us to have a love for one another and a fight within us to stand and contend for the faith. Why? Because deceivers are going to continue to deceive and deceitfulness is going to continue to get worse and worse and worse and worse. Thank you that we have a cause. Thank you that we have a reason. Thank you have a place to come together to help and to support one another, Father. I pray that you'd bless now. Lord, that uh, maybe there's something in our heart and our life that's keeping us from moving forward. Maybe there's something in our heart and our life that uh, we're just enticed by, we're intrigued by, Lord. Maybe, maybe we're watching things that we ought not watch. Maybe we're listening to things we shouldn't listen to. Maybe we're detaching a little bit from the, the other f f uh, body, Lord, the, the other believers, Lord. Maybe, maybe we're detaching from that love with you. God, tonight we can make that right, Father. We can claim 1 John 1, 9 and ask for forgiveness, Lord, that we can get that right. We can get back to that. Lord, maybe we've lost a love for the word of God. I lost a little bit of a love for you, God. We can get that right tonight, Father. I pray, Holy Spirit, if that's anybody in this room, anybody in this room is straying away and and falling to the prey of deceitfulness, Lord, that tonight would be the night they get that right. And Father, I want to say this before we open the invitation as well. If somebody in here is lost, Lord, they've never trusted in Jesus Christ. They've never trusted in your son. They realize they're a sinner, Lord. They, they realize that that sin debt, they cannot pay it back. But God, you sent Jesus Christ to pay that sin debt. And maybe tonight they realize that I can't pay it off, but I know that Jesus did. And tonight's the night that they want to confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that God has raised them from the dead. Tonight's the night they want to call upon Jesus Christ and save them. Father, I pray that you'd give them boldness and courage to come forward and get that right before they leave. Lord, you help us, Father. You bless the invitation. Whatever we need to do to do business with you, God, I pray we'd be bold enough and have the courage to do it. You bless the invitation, now we ask. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The invitation's open. The altar's open. If you need to come and pray, feel free to do that. If you want to stay right there, that's fine. But if God's done something in your heart, brought something to your mind, and you need to get it right, go ahead and take some time and work that out with the Lord.